PC for that introduction. Uh, and uh, actually, you, know, you missed my most important claim uh, to fame, uh, and that is that I am a long-standing friend of Maurice Franklin, uh, and I'm so thrilled to whenever I get a chance uh, to be with my brother Maurice. Uh, and I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity tonight to spend a little time uh, with Maurice. I won't tell old and embarrassing stories uh, about Maurice, uh, but uh, let's just say that um, uh, I was the first one to out Maurice. I didn't know that I was outing Maurice, but I was, and uh, the rest is history. And I guess we're both glad that that <laughs> happened at this point. Uh, CC talked about my founding the Black AIDS Institute, and Maurice was one of the first people that worked with us in the very, very, very very early days of the Black Ace Institute when it was out of my house. And that's where we started. I want to also thank all of the folks who worked so hard on this event. I know how difficult it is to put together uh, an event like this, you know, uh, having done it many, many times. And uh, I, so I want to really thank uh, UBE for the hard work that you're doing and congratulate you on this very, very successful third uh, event. You know, this event epitomizes what my uh, friend, the late Essex Hemphill, talked about when he said, I want to build an organization to save my life. If whales, snails, Chrysler, and Nixon can be saved, then the lives of black men are priceless and should be saved. We should be able to save ourselves. I don't want to wake up one day and read a report by the Heritage Foundation to say that black men are extinct. We should be able to wrap a chain around Anacostia, South Los Angeles, South Dallas, each other. I want to start an organization to save my life. Yesterday was World AIDS Day. This is the day when we want the world to pay attention to the HIV AIDS epidemic. A reporter asked me the other day, so Phil, what do you think the world should know about HIV in, 19, in 2015? Uh, and for me, the answer is simple. Uh, number one, we have the tools to break the back of the AIDS epidemic right now. Number two, we're not there yet. And number three, we are not going to get there unless we keep the pressure on. Now is not the time to let up. Now is the time to put the pedal to the metal. We have new diagnostic tools. No, it has never been easier or simpler or more important to know your HIV status. There's no excuse for not knowing your HIV status. In cities like Dallas, you can get an HIV test for free. It's painless, no more blood, often no needle sticks. It's fast, you can get the results back in 40 minutes, in some cases a minute, no. You can even take an HIV test in the privacy of your own home if you're concerned about that issue. So it's free and it's easy and it's fast and it's painless and you get information that might save your life. What's not to love about that? Now, we should not allow anyone that we know or love or care about not know their HIV status. That should be our call of action. Now, if you know anyone that doesn't know their HIV status, you're not doing your job. And you should feel guilty about that. You should make sure that everybody that you know and care about know their HIV status. We have better surveillance tools. We can now identify where the epidemic is down to the census tract or the zip code. There's a, there's a story about a guy who lost his keys, and he's looking and he's looking and he's looking for his keys, and a second guy happens upon him and he says, my brother, what are you doing? And the first guy says, I'm looking for my keys. And the second guy says, well, where were you the last time you had your keys? And he said, about a mile up the road. Second guy scratches his head. And he says, so why are you looking here? And the first guy says, because the light is better. 
with the new surveillance tools that we have, we can move the light. We can move the light. And often, you know, one of the challenges around the work that we've been doing is that we've been doing the work where the light was better. We've been doing the work where it was easier to do the work. We've been doing the work with the people we know and not where the need was. And so with our new tools, we can move the light. We have better treatment tools. We have tools that are treatment tools that are easier to take. Fewer pills. You take them once a day. In some cases, you can take just one pill a day. They're less toxic. They're more effective. In fact, if you are diagnosed with HIV today and you go on treatment, you're likely to live as long as you would have lived if you didn't you know, get HIV positive. So the treatments are better. Today, there are those of us who have been living with HIV a long time. I've been living with HIV now for 35 years. For 35 years. And a note to Mr. Icon, this is what 60 looks like with HIV on treatment. I will be 60 years old in April. So there are better treatment tools. There are new prevention tools. We now have the ability to stop transmission of HIV. Now, the data tells you that we can interrupt transmission. The data tells you that treatment as prevention you know, is 90-some percent effective. But here's the real tea that there have been no documented cases of an HIV transmission when someone was on treatment and virally suppressed. So we can get people who are living with HIV on treatment, and we can drive down their viral load to undetectable. We can stop transmission of HIV. So we have the ability to stop transmission. We have the ability to stop acquisition with PrEP. And right, Jay with a funny name, PrEP works. Now again, there are no documented cases of someone acquiring HIV when they're on PrEP as prescribed. So if you can end transmission and you can end acquisition, we then break the back of the AIDS epidemic. And so we have prevention tools that work. So we have new diagnostic tools, and new surveillance tools, and new treatment tools, and new prevention tools. We have also a new national HIV strategy, no 2.0. A few months ago, Doug Brooks, the director of ONAP, ONAP in the White House, and the president released the new version of the national HIV strategy. And, and I'd like to share with you the vision statement of the HIV strategy, because I think it is so powerful and so important. The vision statement, our president says that the United States will become a place where new HIV infections are rare, and when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, identity, or social economic cir circumstance, will have unfettered access to high quality, life extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. I think that's a remarkable vision. I think we should hold it up. I think we should aim for it. And I think that we should be painfully aware that we are not there yet. And we won't get there unless we make sure we get there. I was actively involved in the Free South Africa movement and I was lucky enough to be a poll wa watcher during the first free elections in South Africa. And during those days, black women used to stand at transfer station and chant, we are the ones we are waiting for. We are the ones we are waiting for. Because they understood that if apartheid was going to end, if the African regime was going to be dismantled, that they were the ones that were going to do the dismantling. That they could not wait for some outside force to come back to rescue them. It is a lesson that would serve us well. Certainly, 
The government has a role to play in saving our lives. Certainly, there are agencies across this city and this county and this country that have a role to play in ending the AIDS epidemic. They are not-for-profits, they are foundations, there are roles for corporations to play. But if the foundations don't do their job, if the NGOs and the ASOs and the CBOs don't do their job, and the government doesn't do its job, at the end of the day, we still have to survive. At the end of the day, the only one that can save us is us. And we need to own that and we need to understand that. The National HIV AIDS Strategy has four goals. Number one, to reduce new infections. Number two, to increase access to care and improve health outcomes for people living with HIV. Number three is to reduce HIV health disparities uh, and health inequities. And number four, to achieve a more coordinated national response to the HIV epidemic. So how do we get there? My friend Doug Brooks talks about the right people, the right places, and the right actions. So who are the right people? Now when you look at the AIDS epidemic in America today, AIDS in America today is a black disease. People don't like it when I say that, black folks don't like it when I say that, white folks don't like it when I say that, but here are the statistics. Black folks in America represent roughly 12% of the US population, and yet, we represent around 50% of the new HIV AIDS cases in this country. Nearly 50% of people living with HIV and AIDS in this country are black. And nearly 50% of the new HIV AIDS related deaths in this country are black. The most at risk population for HIV on the planet, on the planet, are not in South Africa or Zimbabwe or Zambia no, or Far East Asia. The most at-risk population on the planet are black gay men in America. There is nowhere on the planet where you see HIV rates as high as you see among black gay men in America, particularly among young black gay men in America, and that's not acceptable, and we don't have time to wait for anyone else to do anything about that. We need to start doing that ourselves. That's our responsibility. And while we have made some successes, no, the successes that have happened have not translated evenly across this country. Race matters. We know that race matters. We were delusional for a moment when Barack Obama was elected president. No, we thought that we had, we had become a post-racial America. Uh, and we have been disabused of that notion. We see it every day. Now, the other day, a 53-year-old white man walked into Planned Parenthood in Colorado with an automatic rifle. He killed three people, including a policeman, wounded seven, took hostages, and the police arrested him. He's going to get a trial. Last year, a 16-year-old black boy on the south side of Chicago was running down the street with a knife. The police killed him. He got a funeral. Race matters in this country. Let's not get it twisted. There are challenges and we need to address it. We need to stand up and proud and say that black lives matter. But if we're gonna talk about Black Lives Matter, we can't start the conversation when we're lying dead in the streets. If Black Lives Matter, we need to talk about the achievement gap that exists between black boys and other racial ethnic groups that start as early as six years old. If Black Lives Matter, we need to talk about the 50% unemployment rate of black teenagers in this country. If Black Lives Matter, we need to talk about the nearly 45% of black gay men in America who are already HIV positive. If Black Lives Matter, we need to talk about how we deal with the lives of black men and black women and black boys and black chill children, because otherwise it's not about black lives, it's about black death. You know, there are challenges 
that get in the way for us achieving the end of the AIDS epidemic. Now, I was alarmed last week when Charlie Sheen disclosed his HIV status when you were reading the public blogosphere, you know, and all the comments on social media. You would have thought that we were back in 1996, the way people talked about it. And what it seems clear to me is that for a large swath of America, people stopped paying attention to HIV back in 1996. They don't understand what AIDS looks like in 2015. Part of our job is to make sure that they understand what AIDS looks like in a contemporary setting. It's our job to not just talk about AIDS Awareness Day on December 1st, but as we talk about it in the Black AIDS Institute, every day is AIDS Awareness Day for us, and it needs to be for you as well. We need to talk about criminalization as well. Michael Johnson is a 23-year-old HIV-positive black gay student in St. Charles, Missouri. Last week, he was sentenced to 60 years in prison for not being able to prove that he had disclosed his HIV status to his sexual partners. Sexual partners, by the way, who sought him out, who aggressively sought him out. Michael was okay when he was a championship wrestler for the college. Michael was okay when the white boys was, was calling him out on Jack because they wanted to have sex with him. But then all of a sudden, this black body became a threat. And because most of his partners were white and he was black, now the jury now decided that no one would have sex with him if they knew that he was HIV positive. So obviously, he was lying about disclosure because that's what HIV positive people do. That's what gay men do. That's what black people do. And all the stereotypes now, came into play, and this young man is now going to spend the next 30 years of his life in prison, not because he didn't disclose, but because he couldn't prove that he did. Because the criminalization laws don't even require transmission. Criminalization laws don't even require infection. You can go to prison even if you use a condom. You can go to prison even if you are in treatment as for prevention and you're undetectable and you use a condom. No. The criminalization laws undermine our ability to end the AIDS epidemic. Young women, particularly young trans women, can go to prison because they have condoms in their purses because condoms is evidence of prostitution. Yeah. So all the messages that we use around protecting yourself are undercut if we don't address the criminalization and if we don't understand how the criminalization laws are used disproportionately as a weapon against black people, against young gay men, against women, against trans women. Now, this is a fight that we need to take on. The other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we, are, we understand and we have the tools and the skills to end the AIDS epidemic. All the tools in the world are worthless if we don't understand them, if we don't know how to use them, and if we don't believe they work. Last, earlier this year, the Black AIDS Institute released our national survey of the HIV workforce where we looked at the knowledge level of people working in HIV. And the results were a little disappointing. We discovered that on a national level, there was 61% competency overall on HIV knowledge in the AIDS workforce, those of us who are working in HIV. Here in Dallas County, uh, that number is only 58%. And when we look at treatment knowledge of people who are working in, the for, in, in, in HIV in this county, treatment knowledge is only 48%. And when we look at biomedical knowledge, treatment as prevention, no PrEP, 
the knowledge here was 38%. Only 26% of folks working in HIV in this county are very familiar with PrEP. Only 37% are very familiar with treatment as prevention. No, uh, Maya Angelou said, when we know better, we do better. When we know better, we do better. We need to know better. We need to do better by knowing better. And so all of us need to make sure that we have the skills and the knowledge that we need to get the job done. Now, we are in a biomedical HIV world. We are in a post-AIDS Affordable Care Act world. We are in a world where we have to know things that maybe we didn't have to know five or 10 years ago, and it's our job to make sure that we're up to the task. When we know better, we do better. I'm optimistic that we are going to get to the end game. Now, someone said to me, well, you know, they're doing this research on cure. And yes, the, new treat the, the treatments that we have today are not a cure. And they said, are you worried that when they come up with a cure, that black folks are going to be left behind because the price will be too high? And I said, no, that's not my greatest worry. My greatest worry is that if they come up with a cure tomorrow and it's free and it's sent to everyone's homes, that we won't use it. I'm afraid that we'll get left behind because we're not willing to get on the bus. It's important for us to make sure that when there are answers to our questions, that we are there to help each other get on the bus. That we're there to understand what works and so that we can make decisions that are in our best interest. I have a reoccurring dream. And in my dream, there's a little boy who asked a wise old woman, what did you do during the plague years? What did you do when millions of people were dying? I always wake up before the wise old woman has a chance to answer. I'm afraid I wake up because I'm afraid of the answer. I'm afraid that the answer will be not enough. And no matter who you are, whether you're a young person in this room or a not so young person in this room, the day will come when you will be asked that question. What did you do during the plague years? What did you do when young, black, gay, bisexual, men who have sex with men, same gender loving men were dying or getting infected? I hope the answer will not be not enough. The day will come when this epidemic will be open. And when it does, it's important for them to know we were not all monsters. We were not all cowards. Some of us dared to care in the face of it. Some of us dared to love in spite of it. Some of us dared to fight because of it because it is in the caring and the loving and the fighting that we live forever. Thank you. For more information, be sure to check us out online at ubdallas.org or facebook.com backslash ubdallas. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at ubelement.